Good morning. If you don't realize it, today is approximately 43 days after Easter, which means that 40 days after Easter was this past Thursday, which is actually when Ascension was, the Ascension of our Lord Jesus. And so today we're going to focus our attention on what Jesus' Ascension is, why it matters, and why it still matters for us today. Uh, we'll use page 15 as our order of worship this morning. We'll follow the uh, service as printed in your service folder as far as the hymns are concerned. And so we'll begin with hymn number 171.
Please stand. Once again, invite you to turn to page 15 in the front of the red hymnal as we follow the common service this morning as our order of worship. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart to confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mercy on us, Christ have mercy on us, Lord have mercy on us. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and he's given us his only Son as the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now in the peace of that forgiveness that is ours in Christ Jesus, let us respond with a song of praise to the Lord. As we have the privilege of approaching our Lord in prayer, may the Lord be with you. We pray. Lord Jesus, King of glory, on that day of ascension, you ascended far above the heavens, and at God's right hand, you still rule the nations. Do not leave us alone, we pray, but grant us the spirit of truth that at your command and by your power, we may be your witnesses in all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, interceding for us as one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We turn to the Word of God as printed in your service folder. We we have in that first lesson for today the account of the ascension of our Lord from the book of Acts chapter 1. I wrote my first book, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began doing and teaching until the day he was taken up, after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he presented himself alive to the apostles with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days 
and told them things about the kingdom of God. Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for what the Father promised, which you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they were together with him, they asked, Lord, is this the time when you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said these things, he was taken up while they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he went away. Suddenly, two men in white clothes stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? The same Jesus who's been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of our God. Let's join in uh, Psalm 47. It's on page 85 in the front of the hymnal. Our second lesson this morning from the book of Ephesians chapter 1 as we get some insight into what is Jesus actually doing now that he's ascended into heaven. Apostle Paul writes, I never stop giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowing Christ fully. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know the hope to which he has called you, just how rich his glorious inheritance among the saints is, and just how surpassingly great his power is for us who believe. It is as great as the working of his mighty strength, which God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and above every name that is given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. God also placed all things under his feet and made him head over everything for the church. The church is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. These are God's words. 
Let's join in the verse of the day as printed in your service folder. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Alleluia. Surely I am with you always until the end of the age. Alleluia. Please stand. Our gospel this morning, also serving as our sermon text, is from Luke's gospel, chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. Jesus said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, this is what is written, and so it must be. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Look, I'm sending you what my father promised, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He led them out as far as the vicinity of Bethany. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was taken up into heaven. So they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They were continually in the temple courts, praising and blessing God. Amen. These are the words of our gospel this morning. Turn to the front of the red hymnal to pages 18 and 19 as we join in confessing our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. Pages 18 and 19. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life the world to come. You may be seated. We'll join together and sing in our next hymn as posted, hymn 174.
Grace and peace are yours from our save us in that flawless, perfect way to die as innocent, though committed no crime, was treated as the worst of all for our sins. The one who proved himself to be the Savior by rising again on the third day and the one who ascended to the right hand of the Father, as we've heard in many of our readings already today, who lives and rules and governs for the good of his people, his church. Dear brothers and sisters of God's church. In the early Christian church, there were three major festivals that people would celebrate. Two of them are highly acknowledged, commercialized today. You can guess what they are. They're the two high points of the church year and well stereotypically that's when most people go to church if they're going to go Christmas and Easter right those holidays pretty much have been robbed of any religious really Christ-centeredness by the world and materialism and consumerism but the last one which you can guess which is what we celebrate today Jesus' ascension, that one pretty much by and large has been untouched. I'm willing to bet that many of you coming in today didn't really remember, or maybe sometimes didn't even know, that it was actually ascension this past Thursday. It's one of those high points of the church year that we really don't realize or recognize or even acknowledge because it's often something that just kind of gets swept under the carpet of springtime, end of school, and all the highlights are done from Christmas and Easter, and so now we're just kind of, we're forging ahead, and July 4th is coming up, and that's our next major holiday. Sadly, the church has kind of turned a blind eye to the subject of ascension, and so that's why we as God's people are going to take a look at it today. We're going to see that Jesus' ascension does matter. It matters because of what it means, it matters because of why Jesus ascended, and it matters especially because of what will happen in the future. You see, there can be a direct line drawn between Jesus' last words, physical last words, here to his disciples, and you and me today, and his return again as he has promised. Isn't it interesting that the last thing Jesus spoke to his disciples was, I'm going to come back again, just as I left. That's what he said as this, as this, at his ascension. So we're going to take a look again at what that means, why he said those, why that is written for us to see, and what it means and why it matters in what will be in the end. Now, if you're Jesus' disciples today... <laughs> And you've experienced all this. You've seen all his miracles. You've lived through them all. You've seen this perfect Savior, flawless as he was, never committed any crimes, was accused of all kinds of them. Pharisees never failed to point out everything Jesus did wrong. In fact, that's kind of the reason why he was put to death, right? Because he claimed to be something they thought he wasn't. A Savior? You've just lived through this horrible, horrific, emotional turmoil of seeing your master teacher put to death and then all of it has been flipped over because what you thought wasn't possible actually was and actually is because Jesus has been appearing over and over to people over 40 days and now he comes and he tells you all right guys now I got to go it's time to leave and in your mind as a disciple you're thinking that's not the right move Jesus this is not the right thing to do. You just, came, you just did something that nobody else could do. Everybody's going to follow you now. Everybody's going to latch on. To, this is not the right time to go. And Jesus turns and he says, yeah, it is. This is exactly the right time. And so he has to turn to his disciples today and he has to tell them these words. These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. What's all that that needs to be fulfilled? What I just went through. Jesus needed to come to live. He needed to come to die in our place. He needed to rise from the dead so that he could return back to the Father. 
Isn't it interesting? He uses some of the same words. Now Luke's writing, of course. He's using some of the same words that he would use um, in another account when he's, remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus. These are familiar words that Jesus would use. Now again, what does he say to them? How does he convince them? Does he say, well, guys, I'll do another miracle here for you. That'll convince you. As if rising from the dead wasn't enough. Get this. Jesus does the same thing with his disciples as he does with you and me. What does he do? He takes them back to the Word, doesn't he? He takes them back to history. Oh, you know, but they say history, you know, it's boring and it's old information. We need new, updated, upgraded information. That's old stuff. We don't really want to hear about it. It's boring. Facts and figures, dates, all that kind of stuff. Well, as they say, history rhymes. It repeats itself. And those who are not students of history are bound to repeat the same mistakes of the past. Jesus didn't want his disciples to make those same mistakes. He didn't want them to live in the same unbelief and sins of those of the past. So that's why he points them in the word of God to one thing. Actually, one person. Me. No, 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 not me. Himself. Jesus. Isn't that what the Bible is all about? It's not about a church. It's not about social programs. It's not about a 12-step program to a better life. It's not about you getting it right in your life so that you can stand before God and say, but God, look at all the good things that I've done in my life. It's not about trying to be better than someone else. It's not trying to be a better person than what I have been in the past because you're going to fail again. You and I are a bunch of sinners, which is why it has to be about Jesus, which is why it has to be about the law of Moses that convicts us and tells us of our sin, but also tells us of the one Jesus who perfectly completed that. Which is why it has to be about the prophets, which is that Old Testament and very oftentimes even New Testament, we just went through the book of Revelation, it's prophetic writings that tell us this Jesus, he is the only one who can save you and did save you. And the Psalms are kind of a little mixture of both in poetic form, and that's why we use them each week. It's all about God's Word. It's all about what Jesus did with the disciples, opening their minds to understand what was written about Him, those things we call the Scriptures. Doesn't Jesus do that with you too? He uses the Word of God. He doesn't use cute miracles. He could, But as human beings, we, we always want more. If God would give us a miracle, we would always say, well, you've got to top that one, and then I'll believe. And God simplifies it, and he says, I'll just give you what even little children can understand by the Holy Spirit's work. I'll give you my promises in the precious and pure word of God. And I'll give you that word so that when, when you know what in the head that the Holy Spirit then connects that to the heart so that you not only know it, but then you believe it. And then by believing it, you end up taking what you know and you go with that word as Jesus would commission his disciples so that you take that word and you preach repentance and forgiveness beginning from Jerusalem. Now, what what do you mean by preaching repentance and forgiveness? Well, we talk about law and gospel, right? That the Bible tells us what to do and what not to do and that ultimately our, our sin has caused us separation from God. And ultimately, if we would have no Jesus, if we, wouldn't, if we wouldn't have a Savior, then we would be doomed ultimately to hell. But repentance also says, because of that sin, I cannot save myself and so I turn from that sin to my Savior Jesus. I turn to that forgiveness. It's that forgiveness that I have that I've been given in my risen and ascended Savior that really moves and motivates me not to trust in myself, not even to despair of my own inadequacies thinking that somehow I just got to be better to be saved, but I turn to trust in Jesus. 
And I tell that to other people too. Because I know that they need that message. Because I know that there are a lot of corpses walking around today that are hollowed out by meaningless materialism. By a Jesus who kind of seems like a God I want him to be, but who's not the risen and ascended Lord, he tells us, in his word. And so when Jesus tells them to preach this repentance and forgiveness, he says, do it from Jerusalem. Not because Jerusalem is this holy city and that that's the only place you can do it, but that's where you're going to start. I guess we could say it's kind of like um, we ask the question, why does this church exist? If I were to ask you that, what's your response? I don't want to hear anything right now, but think about it. Why does this church exist? And then why are you a part of it? What are you doing as a part of this church to be those who would exist from Jerusalem? We could say, go preach repentance and forgiveness beginning from Mishikot. What's Jesus actually saying? He's saying, I've given you the what. I've given you the information. I've equipped you. I've even led you to believe this. Now I'm sending you out, as he told his disciples, You've been witnesses of these things. Whether the Holy Spirit has convicted you or not, whether you're joining us online, whether you are here as a guest and the Holy Spirit, you're just not quite there yet. All of these things that Jesus did in his word make us witnesses that we've seen that you cannot deny that there is another who meets these qualifications. You cannot deny that Jesus, being the perfect substitute in living, innocent substitute in dying as sacrifice, and the only one in history who has risen from the dead and raised others to life, he's the only one that fits the picture of who God is. And that's what the scriptures testify. And Jesus is sending now his disciples and he's giving them their why, which is ours too. As you know the what, now you go out and you be my witnesses. He says to them, look, I'm sending you what my father promised. But now stay in the city till you're clothed with power from on high. Wouldn't be a very good thing if Jesus would send them out with no tools. I'm reminded of a situation I was in a couple weeks ago. My neighbor is a pilot, and he flies small engine airplanes. And he took me out uh, one afternoon, and I'm flying with him, and all of a sudden he says, okay, well, this wouldn't be anything unless uh, you fly. And I, I said, okay, but I don't know how. And he said, well, it's pretty easy. <laughs> I thought, yeah, right, okay, you've been doing this forever. And he said, okay, just take over now. <laughs> no, you don't want that. I don't know what I'm doing. What do these things on the floor, what do these feet things do? Well, you just push them and it goes, I don't know that. Anyway, regardless, I tried it and it, we pretty much could have crashed. Anyway, regardless. <laughs> he took back over, so we didn't. Obviously, I'm here, but it's reminding me of Jesus could have just stepped away. He did everything he needed to do. He fulfilled all of his father's plans. He took care of everything on his own. He flew through everything just fine. And if he would have just said, all right, disciples, here you go, which, by the way, they didn't have the whole Bible yet. Remember, this is still being written. They had the Old Testament, Moses, prophets, Psalms, which was enough, still pointed to Jesus. But Jesus always gives us more. He always teaches us, if you're going to be my witnesses, because you and I are too, you and I are still witnesses of these things. He doesn't leave you with a relic to sit on your shelf and you just hold it close to your heart, but you never open it up. I'm talking about your Bible. He doesn't leave you with something to worship on the outside because that's worthless. You open the scriptures. You dive into them. That's why we have Bible study. That's why you learn and you yearn to study more. Not just the head knowledge. 
but that which connects to your heart so that you as witnesses of God's love for you and his word, what he still uses, right? He connects you to him. He shows you your why too. And he sends you out to be those witnesses from Mishakot, from wherever you're at, out to the ends of the earth. But he does you one better. At the end, he lifts up his hands and he blesses them. Does that look familiar? You get that at the end of every service. And it's not just a, all right, guys, it's time for the service to be done now. We've got to figure out some way to close the service and shut her down so you can go back to life as usual. That's not just a goodbye. That's a reminder at the end of every single service. When you hear Jesus giving you that blessing through a sinful man like your pastor, that's Jesus giving you that same blessing and a reminder, hey, you're not just leaving here to go back to life as usual. You're my witnesses. It's like I always tell you, it's the second half of the sermon, right? That's where you take over. You take what you've gained in knowledge and you connect, the Holy Spirit is connected to heart. And you go out in the world and you're reminded of what Jesus finally said. I'll, I'll come back in the same way you've seen me go. So that thread is connected, isn't it? You and I are actually connected with that slender thread with Jesus who is still up in heaven and he's waiting. He's given us work to do while we're waiting. He's telling us every day my ascension matters. And he doesn't leave us with nothing. Remember what he tells you, those promises? I'll be with you. Not once. Not when you can't do it on your own. <laughs> but always. To the very end of the age. And just so you know, what I'm doing is not just sitting up in heaven twiddling my thumbs or playing video games with somebody else. I'm actually that one who's the mediator between God and man, the man being Christ Jesus, who knows us and knows exactly the trials and temptations we go through because he went through them perfectly, full, full, fulfillingly for you and me. And so now he sits at the right hand of the Father. Again, it's a, a metaphoric place, a seat of power. And he, and he tells the Father each and every time as he intercedes for us, you see what I've done for them? Don't punish them. Instead, send your Holy Spirit into their hearts. And that's what next week is all about. So you and I really can see that as Jesus told his disciples, he tells it to you too. I'll come back in the same way you saw me leave. Now you and I didn't see him leave, but we don't see him today. Not with our eyes. At least not these physical ones. But Jesus didn't really leave us, did he? He didn't leave us and say, well, you don't matter. <laughs> it's all about me. He gave us his word, his testimony. He showed us why he gave it to us. Be my witnesses. And he taught us and told us that as you're waiting and watching, the promise is found also in your purpose. I'll come back just as I promised when I judge the world in the end, I want to also see you hard at work because you know how it ends. And so we would maybe respond by the Spirit's grace as that New Testament church did. They worshiped him. Now stop right there. They worshiped Jesus? He wasn't there. He left. Yeah. Yeah. They worshipped him because as he had promised, he never did leave. And they returned to Jerusalem, just as he said, with great joy. And they kept doing that. They were continually in the temple courts praising and blessing God, and it was filled with amen. Isn't that why you keep coming back here? Isn't that why you encourage one another and be encouraged by one another physically in the same building? You can't get that if you're just by yourself. 
You can't be a witness or be equipped if you're just by yourself, away from the Word of God especially. Jesus' ascension still matters. Knowing what, knowing why, and knowing what will be makes all the difference in the world. And in the end, as Jesus taught us today, you and I are still witnesses. So let's go do what a witness does. See and say. Not more, not less. Not making up new stories, but telling others. Jesus does matter. Amen. Please rise. Now may that peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you are our strength and our song. You've prepared for us a well of salvation in Jesus Christ, your Son, who through the eternal Spirit made himself an offering for the sins of the whole world. We thank you. Most especially, we praise you for the life of grace and truth that Jesus lived among us. We thank you that through him you've unfolded your glorious purposes. Move our hearts to believe all that he has taught to love one another as he has commanded and love them with your word of truth. Grant as we celebrate with joy the ascension of our Lord, that even as you have raised him to the right hand of your power and majesty, may we ever exalt and praise him in adoration and prayer, and find in him the springs of gladness and devotion. Lift the eyes of your church heavenward to see him who ever lives to make intercession for the saints and grant your people sure and a sure hope and confidence in your greatness and power. Make us your witnesses to the ends of the earth. We pray also for your mercy on those who would be afflicted in any way. We plead for your precious help to all those who are sick. Give them confidence that whatever they ask in accordance with your will, you will give. Comfort them with the knowledge that in all things you work for the good of those who love you. On this... Uh, Day, this weekend, we also set aside to honor those who have died in the service of our country. Lord God, we thank you for giving us such patriotic citizens and a country that chooses to remember them. Today, we thank you for the saints who have gone before us in your service and have preserved for us the rich heritage of your gospel. We remember each of the blessings you gave to them and to us through them. Finally, Lord, be also a courage and strength to those in Texas who have lost. Be with us and, and guide us and comfort us with the knowledge of our Savior's ascension. Prepare our hearts for his coming again and when he will take us to be with you forever. This and everything else which remains in our hearts, we ask in the name of Jesus, the name above every name, in the prayer as he has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We'll continue on page 21 in the front of the hymnal if you'd like to join with the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is 
It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in every place give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we praise you especially for the glorious resurrection of your Son, the true Passover Lamb, who by his sacrifice took away the sins of the world and by his resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join in their glorious song. Please stand as we'll continue. Page 24 with the Song of Simeon. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. O oh God, the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you've given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we willingly serve you day after day, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. You may be seated. We'll close with our final hymn, Hymn 170. <laughs> 